Chapter 12. Some Notable French Collectors Speculation, Financial Disasters Many Collections Change Hands Fakers Busy for Newly Enriched Collectors Voltaire Plays the Silent Partner to Art and Curio Dealers Wonderful Unearthings of Dr. Hubert Collectors of the Time Madame Pompadour, Cardinal Soubise, Malzerbe and others Interspace of the Revolution Napoleon revives some of the speedy methods of the Romans. Italian museums and galleries plundered by his imperial agents. From this early period we enter that of the art sales, which, as we have already said, seem characteristic of the 18th century. Financial disasters and speculations disperse more than one fortune and usher newcomers into the world of finance. This is the time when masterpieces begin to change hands so rapidly. The spirit of collecting is superseded by that of commerce, and faking appears under new forms, those with no other trickery beyond what commerce with its intrigue and deceit can supply. All amateurs, writes a contemporary in the Chronique Scandaleuse, are now mixed up with brocantage, bric-a-brac. There is not a collector who does not sell or exchange, troc, either on account of unstable taste or for the sake of gain, or to retaliate his own bad bargain upon someone greener than himself. Even Voltaire, between an epigram and a satire, found himself implicated in brocantage, only more shrewd than Cicero, he saved appearances by an associate, the Abbe Moussinot, he remaining the sleeping partner. Voltaire's name and his banter over natural history and explanations of geological phenomena Buffon, the author of a natural history that Voltaire called not all that natural, was one of his victims, he having replied to Buffon's learned hypothesis with regard to some seashells found on the summit of the Alps that the shells might have been lost by pilgrims on their way to Rome, recalls to our mind an 18th century successful piece of faking and practical joke played on an erudite collector, Dr. Louis Hubert of Würzburg. In the year 1727, two doctors of the town prepared a surprise for Hubert, a surprise by which his collection of fossils was to be enriched by some extraordinary specimens. Speculating on the enthusiasm and good faith of the learned doctor and impassioned collector, the two accomplices fabricated fossils of fantastic animals and the most impossible shells. The imitations were generally modelled in clay with the addition of a hardening substance. Incredible as it may sound, some of them represented ants and bees of the most heroic proportions, crabs of new line and shape, etc. These were carefully buried in ground of suitable character where Professor Hubert had been seen to excavate. The rest is easily divined. What is not easy to understand, however, is the fact that after having made several of these most incredible discoveries, Dr. Hubert thought it fit to publish a work, consisting of a hundred folios written in Latin and issued under the auspices of Professor Beranger. The book, which was dedicated to the Bishop of Franconia, had 22 illustrations reproducing with extreme exactitude Dr. Louis Hubert's fantastic antediluvian find. But this is not all. The learned faculty of science of Würzburg assembled to honour Dr. Hubert, and the doyen of the faculty pronounced a speech in praise of his discovery. What followed can be easily deduced. Only his good faith saved the deceived collector from the sore experiences of a modern sham discoverer of the North Pole. The curio world, however, still counts some good art lovers and serious collectors, such as Gerson, Basson, whom the Duc de Choiseul used to call le maréchal du Saxe de la curiosité on account of his daring and successful inroads on the art market, where, by the way, though no blood is shed, no less strategy is needed than on the battlefield. There are other names worth quoting in this century of decadence. Gloomy and his friend Remy, painter and dealer in pictures and other curios, Julio, Langlier, Pele, Renaud de Lande, Pierre Le Brun and his son J. B. Le Brun, who married the famous artist Mademoiselle Vigy and owned the well-known Salle Le Brun, often used for celebrated sales. Other names might be quoted. La Marquise de Pompadour, Cardinal Soubise, Girardot de Verfonte, Fontette, Malzerbe, Marquis de Palmy, etc. Then the revolution comes, the Ancien Régime disappears, and with it the dainty furniture, foppish dress and the supremacy of an art market which with all its oddities were such perhaps as had never been seen since the time of the orgy of curio hunting of ancient rome 
This supremacy, deprived of many of its idiosyncrasies, temporarily crossed the Channel and went to England accompanied by many of the treasures that dealers and refugees managed to save from the cataclysm of 1779. Napoleon may be quoted as an exceptional art collector, if ever such a name can belong to a man utterly deprived of a sense of art, but shrewd enough to understand the mighty support given to sovereigns by art. For in the process of time the man formed more than one art collection by methods that in their drastic character greatly resemble those adopted by Roman generals and proconsuls. This statement is eloquently supported by facts and numbers. Here is a laconic writing of Napoleon, in which he informs the directory of his first artistic finds in Italy. Speaking of his agents, he states, They have already seized 15 paintings from Parma, 20 from Modena, 25 from Milan, 40 from Bologna, 10 from Ferrara. This is, of course, his first experience as a novice collector. Other things were to follow the Medici Venus from Florence, the Roman horses from Venice, and all the best works of art from the Italian museums, and these but foster more eclectic desires in this strange art lover, who, while preoccupied with the problem of transporting heavy statues from Rome and harvesting antiques and Renaissance work, indiscriminately orders to be taken to France with the artistic booty the votive pen that Justus Lipsius left to the sanctuary of Loreto and the votive image left by Montaigne to the same sanctuary. The anecdote of Lucius Mummius of ignorant memory is here repeated in a way, for the officials acting under Napoleon's orders have nothing to say about Montaigne's ex voto, but when it comes to the pen of Lipsius, these worthies gleefully remark, La plume de Juste Lips qui aura été estimé cent huitième s'est trouvé pesé six huitième. The pen of Just Lips, which was supposed to weigh five eighths, has been found to weigh six eighths. From the Revolution to the time of Napoleon's dominion is the period in which the passion for art collecting is least felt. Faking, of course, is an art that does not pay and thus has no raison d'etre. Yet faking passes from the field of art to that of real life. The new republic apes Roman customs. David the artist is faked into a tribune while busy painting Romans that seem to have been brought out of a hothouse, and he sketches semi-Roman costumes for the new officials of the Republic, garments that with all the foppishness of the old regime had Roman consular swords, imperial clamys, mantle, faked buskins or ornamented cathernus, boots worn by tragedians. It is this faking of life that feels the need even to alter the calendar, changing the Roman etymology of the names of the months into more resounding Latinesque appellations. At home in this staged drama of life, Napoleon, the friend of Talma and David, continues the grandiose faking with a sort of complex etiquette and a veneer of aristocracy, which makes one sadly think of the truth of the words pronounced by Cuyer on General Bonaparte's elevation to the throne. He aspires to descend. Yet even in this peculiar and rather negative world, the chronicle of the Cuya may contain some glorious names, and these no doubt prepared at the beginning of the 19th century the return of the cult of art in France, the reappearance of devoted collectors and enlightened amateurs. We may then name successively art lovers and intelligent collectors such as Lenoir, de Somerville and Sauvageau, Crevrol Villemain and after them artists, collectors and dealers of the calibre of Mademoiselle Delaunay, Escudier, Montfort, Roussel, Berdelet, Henri Rangen, Mannheim, the first of a dynasty of honest and intelligent dealers. Then, almost in our own times, Baron de Villiers, Bonafé, Émile Père and others, but art collecting is now no longer an accentuated characteristic of France nor of England, Germany and other European countries which have a tradition and have come to the fore. But other new and powerful states have joined the contest, cast new types of collectors and created a new psychology in the art world which will form the second part of this book. End of chapter 12 and part 1